Good morning and welcome to our worship today. As we gather together this morning, we are going to consider and rejoice in the fact that our Lord indeed does all things well and he does all things well for us. From our Old Testament reading from Isaiah chapter 35, we see some of those things that our Savior does well that were prophesied of him, that he would open the eyes of the blind, that he would open the ears of the deaf, and there's sort of this general feel of how he's going to restore everything that we have broken by our sinfulness in this creation. But why does he do this? It's certainly not because we deserve it, as our epistle reading from James chapter 2 makes clear. Our epistle reading talks specifically about the sin of partiality, of, of showing preference for one person over another. And the point is that this sort of thing is worthless. We're all sinners, and we don't deserve anything good from our God. We don't deserve for him to do anything well for us. And yet we rejoice today that he does it anyway. And our sermon text from Mark chapter 7 shows us two miracles that really teach us not just that our Savior does all things well, but it teaches us the important lesson of why he would do that for us, and then it describes what all things well he does for us specifically. So with those thoughts in mind, we'll ask the Lord's blessing on our worship this morning. Speak, O Lord, because we, your servants, are listening. Give us understanding that we may know your testimonies. Incline our hearts to the words of your mouth. Speak, Lord, for you have the words of eternal life. Speak to us to comfort our souls and to purify our lives. Speak that you may receive praise, glory, and everlasting honor. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn 364 from the Red Hymnal.
Please rise. We follow the order of worship this morning as you find it printed in the bulletin and as projected. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Hear the voice of my supplications. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and to call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, let your merciful ears be open to the prayers of your humble servants and grant that what they ask may be in accord with your gracious will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 35. We'll read verses 4 through 7. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, this, this passage is all about what some of the things that the Messiah would do when he came. And in the bigger picture is that story of the restoration that comes through our Savior of creation, of our sinful natures. All of that is restored through our Savior Jesus. We read from Isaiah 35. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, he will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. So far, our Old Testament reading. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 146. We'll read responsibly. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes. His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help. Whose hope is in the Lord his God. Who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Who keeps truth forever. Who executes justice for the oppressed. Who gives food to the hungry. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are brought down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Our epistle reading this morning comes from James chapter 2. We'll read verses 1 through 10 and then verses 14 through 18. James writes, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the, into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. 
Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So far, our epistle reading. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. We take this opportunity now to confess together our common Christian faith. We'll do so using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please rise for the confession of our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our service continues with the singing of hymn 26 in the Red Hymnal.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text this morning comes from our gospel reading from Mark chapter 7. We read verses 24 through 37. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying, Go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone and her daughter lying on the bed. And again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they, be and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one, but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it, and they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. So far from God's holy word. Dear fellow redeemed, beloved of God, Jesus does all things well. That's what everybody says at the end of our text this morning. The miracles that Jesus does, it, it really amazes everybody, doesn't it? But not so much us. Because we know the whole story, right? We know that Jesus does all things well. We know that Jesus is the sinless son of God, right? We know what he came to do. So it doesn't amaze us at all when we see this. Of course, Jesus does all things well. But in our sermon text this morning, we get answers to two very important questions to see how that fact that Jesus does all things well, how that applies to us. First, we want to ask, why would the Lord, who does all things well, do them for you? And then second, what all things does the Lord, who does all things well, do for you? What are those specific things? In the two miracles that we have before us this morning, we get the answers to these all-important questions. And the answers are full of good news for us. So why would the Lord, who does all things well, do them for you? I'm guessing that if you surveyed the general public on this question, you would get a variety of answers, but for most of them, they would expect that God would do things good for them because what? Because they have done good things. Because they've done well, right? Because they're good people. God does things for good people, right? Well, who's a good person? Think about the gospel readings from the last two weeks, from earlier in Mark chapter 7, where we learn what? that by our nature, the only thing that comes out of our hearts are unclean things. And you just heard in our epistle reading from James chapter 2, that if somebody keeps the law in all parts and yet fails in just one place, that they're guilty of breaking the whole law. So no, we can't count on being good enough as part of expecting that God is going to help us in some way. That's just not going to do it. Our goodness isn't going to cut it. But we do have someone that we can hang our hopes on. We have a much better reason to hope for God's help. We see that in our first miracle this morning. So Jesus here leaves Judah and Galilee behind, and he's trying to just get away from it all. In fact, 
Jesus has been trying to get away from it all for a while now. You can go all the way back into at least Mark chapter 6, where we have that account of the feeding of the 5,000. When Jesus feeds the 5,000, what's he trying to do? He's trying to get away from everybody. So he's still trying to do that. He's still trying to get away, probably so he could have that private time for teaching his disciples, that private time to be involved with prayer to his heavenly Father as well. So he goes into this house to try to get out of sight, only it doesn't work. There's this Syrophoenician woman, a Gentile woman, who finds out where he is, who seeks him out. She has this daughter with an unclean spirit, which of course she has no ability to cure, but she's heard about Jesus. And she's heard about Jesus' miracles. And so she finds out where Jesus is and she keeps bothering him and pestering him. And boy, does she. We don't really get the full account here in Mark's gospel. But if you go to Matthew chapter 15, where this same account is told, it's told there in more detail. And we hear that this woman kept coming after him and crying to him for mercy. So much so that the disciples basically say that she needs to just be sent away. And he's ignoring her, so it seems. And yet she continues to be persistent, even following him into this house here. So how does Jesus respond to all of this? Well, this strikes me as maybe one of the most un-Jesus-like statements that Jesus ever makes in all of the scripture. Listen to what he says again to her in verse 27. He says, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Yep, that's right. He called her a little dog. This woman who is at the end of her rope, who is distraught beyond what probably any one of us could imagine because her daughter is possessed with this demon, Jesus calls her a little dog. <laughs> and so it raises an important question then. Why should Jesus help her? What's going to intrigue Jesus to help her? She can't say to Jesus, first of all, that Jesus should help her because she's a fellow Jew, right? Because she's not. That's why it's mentioned here that she's a Syrophoenician, a Gentile woman. And that gives us an answer, by the way, to the reason why she's called a little dog in our text. It was sort of a slang that the Jews used to refer to Gentiles. So Jesus is basically saying here, look, you're not one of the descendants of Israel. Why should I help you? She can't say that she gets his help because of persistence either. Persistence can be a good thing, right? You know, we're told to, to, to keep asking, to keep seeking, to keep knocking. But you know, that persistence can also just be annoying, right? Remember, Jesus is trying to get away from it all here, and this woman keeps pestering him again and again, and... We also are not actually given the promise that God is going to give us whatever we want just because we're persistent enough. So she can't hang her hat on being a Jew because she's not one. She can't hang her hat on being persistent because that's no promise that God is going to do exactly what you want him to do. So what is it then? Is it because she's good enough? We've already covered that one. We know that she's not good enough. There's no reason for Jesus to help her. But here's the twist in this account then. She knows it. She gets it, doesn't she? She understands that there's nothing about her that would cause Jesus to help. And so when Jesus gives this unjesus like response, let the children first be filled, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs, what does she do? She doesn't object. She doesn't argue. She says, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Notice, if Jesus calls her a dog, what is she willing to say that she is? Well, that I must be a dog, because that's what Jesus says. And so she admits there, doesn't she, that there's nothing about her that would compel Jesus to help her. But she understands that it's not about her, but it's about him. It's about who he is. It's about what he's doing. 
as the Messiah sent from God, he might be first sent to the Jews. But he wasn't only sent to the Jews, was he? God had promised that salvation was going to come to all of the world through the Savior. So by way of response, this woman again is saying, you and I both know that there is nothing in me to, that, that deserves your help, but I'm not asking because I'm me, I'm asking because you're you. You're the Savior of the whole world. And once Jesus hears that, notice what he says here. For this saying, go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. In Matthew's gospel, we get it even even more clearer, uh, the astonishment that Jesus has at her faith when he says, O woman, great is your faith. And of course, when she gets home, she finds that the demon had indeed left her daughter. So back to that first question, then why would the Lord who does all things well do anything well for you? This woman gives the answer. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. There's nothing good about us that would compel our God to answer our prayers. We can't demand that God helps us because, of, because we were born into the CLC. We can't count on God helping us because we're good enough. We can't help, count on God helping us because we're persistent enough, because we ask and ask and ask, and finally he's going to give us whatever we want. And as long as we think that we are going to earn God's help because of something that we do or because of something good within us, we should not be surprised if the Lord does not answer our prayer. See, as long as you're saying that there's something about you that deserves God's favor, that deserves for him to answer our prayer, we're denying his grace and his mercy because that's what it's all about. He answers us because of his grace and his mercy. It's not because we've earned it. He answers us because Jesus died for us. Because God sent his only beloved son to live that perfect life, to credit that righteousness to you, and to go to the cross to pay for every one of your sins. For all of those sins of those times where you, think, where, where you thought that you have earned God's favor by your works and tried to rely on that. He went and paid for every one of those. And in that, he shows his grace and his mercy. In that grace and mercy, then, he has forgiven your sins. He's made you his own beloved child, and he has opened the doors of heaven to you. This is all true in Christ. It's all true only because of Christ. So as Christians, we don't pray to God, God, answer me because I've earned it, but we say, Lord, hear me for the sake of Jesus. That's why we pray not in our own name, but we pray in his name. And when we pray for the Lord's help in Jesus' name, according to his will, those prayers delight our God. He promises to hear, and he promises to answer them. Maybe not exactly in the way that we want, but he's going to answer them according to what he knows is the best for us. If he seems to turn a deaf ear to you, don't be dismayed. He seemed to turn a a deaf ear to this this Syrophoenician woman too, didn't he? But that was only to strengthen her faith all the more. And then he demonstrates that the Lord does answer prayer. Of course, the other reason it may seem like the Lord doesn't answer our prayer is because we're looking for him to give us an answer that we haven't expected. So we better turn to our second miracle then and and ask that question, what are the all things that our Lord, who does all things well, what are those things that he does specifically for us? So Jesus moves on from here then, and he goes through the Decapolis, Greek cities that are by the Sea of Galilee, And word spreads again that Jesus is there, and so this man is brought into him that can't hear, and he speaks with a speech impediment. They beg Jesus to lay hands on him. And this is sort of a miracle that Jesus does in a little bit of a different way. He doesn't just speak as he often does, but he puts his fingers into the man's ears, and then he spits, he touches the man's tongue, he looks up into heaven, praying to the Father. And then 
One of the parts that we might skip over here is that he sighs. That word sigh in the original language probably is more like a groan. It's not that he's just sighing from exasperation, but it's a groan of taking the pain of that man into himself as he heals him. And then he does speak, of course, because it's his word that he works through, and so he speaks his word. He says, Ephatha, be opened. And by his word, Jesus speaks and the man can hear. <laughs> How amazing is that? You know, when we say that our words fall on deaf ears, we mean that people don't hear what we say, right? Because deaf ears can't hear. When Jesus' word falls on deaf ears, those deaf ears start to hear. It's amazing. It shows the miracle of faith too, doesn't it? We don't hear... We, we don't hear Jesus because we first believe, do we? But we first believe because we heard Jesus, because he works through his word to bring us to faith. This man can hear now, and his ears are opened. He can speak plainly too, and it's not just that he can speak without that impediment anymore, but he speaks straight talk, if you will. He speaks the truth of what God has done for him. The funny thing is, of course, that Jesus doesn't want him to, and it's often been a mystery, well, why does Jesus say not to say anything? And it seems like the best answer to that question is because they don't have the full story. You see, Jesus' healing, it's only a picture of the real healing that he came to do. Jesus healed this man, and it's very possible that if they went and told this story, not having the full story, that they would think that Jesus was just this great physical healer with this unlimited power. He is that, of course, but that's not the whole story. That isn't, how, that, that isn't why he's come, and it isn't how he saves either. How does he save? He saves in weakness and submission. He saves by dying for the sins of the world. He takes this man's afflictions into himself in this miracle and, and he groans. And that's a picture of how he's going to take all of the sins of the world on himself. And he does more than just groan. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he, he experiences the whole forsakenness of God in our place there. That's what it points to, and that's, that's why Jesus does these miracles in the gospel. We've got a couple of reasons that we can see. The first one comes from our Old Testament reading from Isaiah 35 that prophesies about certain things that the Messiah was going to do. He, he causes the blind to see, he causes the deaf to hear, and we have an example of that, of course, in our gospel reading. So Jesus does miracles because the Old Testament said that he would. That's one reason he does those miracles. He's also giving us a brief glimpse of what's going to happen on the last day when he raises people from the dead, fully restored. We get that picture again in Isaiah 35, don't we? Of the restoration of all of creation. There's a third reason then why Jesus does these miracles in the Gospels. It's to demonstrate the greater miracle that he has the power to forgive sins. Because forgiving sins and saving and giving eternal life that's the greatest miracle of all. So, what all things does the Lord do for us? What's included in that? Can he still work miracles of healing for you? Sure he can. Of course he can. But keep in mind, those miracles that he performs in the New Testament were all for a purpose. And he's proved that purpose. He's shown himself to be the Messiah. He's already given us a glimpse of what's going to happen at the last day that we have been redeemed. He gives that to us in his word. And so he can work those miracles of healing and deliverance if he wants, but he's already proven himself. And he's never promised that he's going to work miracles for us on demand. But that greater miracle that miracle of saving us, of bringing us to faith, he has already done that. And when we have that, what more do we need? 
That's the all things that he does for us. He has already spoken that forgiveness to us. He's done it right here in, that, in, in this service. He's done that through me in the absolution, where you've received, again, that, that assurance of the forgiveness of all of your sins. He has removed also the deafness of your ears to hear his word and to believe in him, to believe that your sins are forgiven forever, that you're a child of God, that heaven is yours. That's the greatest miracle of all. That's what he does for you. As a child of God, then you can be sure that God hears your prayers. He's promised to hear them because he does all things well. And because he does all things well, he's going to hear your prayers well. And what does that mean? It means that he's not always going to give you everything that you want because he knows that not everything you want is good for you. He might answer your prayer in a way that is way different than what you had in mind, but it's better than what you wanted. He does hear. He does answer. And he does everything well. He does that hearing and answering perfectly. And he also prays for you. Just as he looks into the sky in the second miracle and prays to the Heavenly Father for for this man, so he is now sitting at the Father's right hand, constantly making intercession for us, constantly reminding God the Father of his life and death for us and the fact that he must save us, not because of us, but because of what he has done. The Lord has made you and me his. He hears our prayers. He prays for us. He promises to provide everything for our good. And so in this world, yes, we continue to live under a cross. We face troubles. But the Lord even uses those things for our good because he does indeed do all things well. And again, remember, it's because of who he is. And because it's about who he is, it means that We don't have to worry that we're not good enough for God. The answer is, of course, we're not. But we don't have to worry about it. Because Jesus was good enough in our place. And for Jesus' sake, our sins are forgiven. And God hears our prayers. And heaven is ours. Thanks be to God, then, that Jesus does all things well. In his name, amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue by singing together hymn 31 in the red hymn.
Please rise for prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, Heavenly Father, have mercy on us and hear us for Jesus' sake as we bring our prayers and petitions to you. Father, we give you thanks for bringing us to faith through water and the word. Send your spirit to be ever with us to open our ears that we may constantly hear Jesus' word and open our tongues that we may freely glorify him who does all things well. Be with all who serve as pastors and teachers in our churches and schools. Through their preaching and teaching, cause the healing waters of the gospel to flow through the wilderness of this world with the quenching, quenching the thirst with the gift of your spirit. We ask you, O Lord, to cause an increase of pastors and teachers in our midst that they would speak to the anxious of heart, saying, Be strong, fear not, your God will come and save you. Bring to an end in our midst all prejudice that judges with evil thoughts and makes distinctions that dishonor the poor. Be with our Congress, our President, our Justices, and all in authority in our land. Grant them wisdom, courage, civility, and honor as they carry out their difficult responsibilities. O Lord, be with all who suffer oppression from the evil one and all who struggle under sickness or loneliness or grief. Grant them deliverance and healing according to your good and gracious will. We offer you our thanks and praise for the faithful departed. Grant that we may join with them together in glorifying our Savior Jesus forever. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Our closing hymn is hymn number 30 from the Red Hymn.
Good morning once again, everyone. It's good to be with you, to worship with you today. I pray that you were encouraged by the Word of God that we uh, had an opportunity to hear and to participate in in our singing. I pray that you were encouraged by all of that this morning. Uh, I don't have too many announcements that are in the bulletin. Just remember those member visits. I updated the sheet on the bulletin board this morning, so there are the dates going forward for that. Uh, So please do sign up. Um, You know, as far as announcements, too, and I sent this out in the newsletter this week by email, but um, if there are announcements that you would like included in the bulletin, please get those to me each week by Friday. Uh, I, I typically look to print the bulletin as sort of my last order of business on Friday. So if you get me an announcement by the mid-afternoon on Friday, I can probably get it in the bulletin for that week. So just, just let me know on that. Um, oh. Our Bible class just started this week, and we are taking up a study of, well, the relationship between the Old and the New Covenant, which is just like a huge topic. And so what we're starting in on, what we started in on this week, is sort of an overview of the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. And what we're going to do in the class is we're going to take a look at how that Old Covenant is established how it carries throughout the entire Old Testament, and then how it finds its fulfillment in Christ, and then how that new covenant then relates to the old covenant. So kind of a long way to go through. We're going to be taking sort of a survey of Old Testament history in a way. Um, So if you're at all interested in that, um, please come to Bible class on Sundays. Uh, We start at 9 o'clock, and yeah. Um, Sunday school has also started, of course, and uh, so if, if, you're, if you have little ones, it would be good for them to be in Sunday school. So uh, that starts at 9 o'clock as well. I think that's it as far as announcements. Are there any other announcements that should be made at this time? All right. If, oh, go ahead, Rodney. Council meets Tuesday. Oh, right. Yep, so I think I've, do I have that on the calendar or did I skip it? I no, I skipped it. Council meets Tuesday. <laughs> it was in the email. Yep. So council meets Tuesday. That is six thirty, right? Or six o'clock? Six o'clock. Council meets on Tuesday. And with all that confusion, somebody may better make sure that I get there. <laughs> um, oh, I did want to do one more thing. I wanted to thank everybody who was involved with. Uh, with the Fondue Fest yesterday. It was a beautiful day, and so we had a lot of people that came through. Um, special thanks to, uh, to those of you who helped with the face painting and sat there for hours on end. Um, I don't know if there's a way to reimburse them for their carpal tunnel, that I'm sure they all have, but uh, no, it, it's, uh, thank you so much. We had an opportunity to, uh, to hand out a lot of material on our church, and so we pray that the Lord will bless our efforts yesterday and hopefully bring people to visit our church and school and to be among us to hear God's word. All right, now, any other announcements? All right, if not, I pray that the Lord would richly bless you throughout this coming week.